of specialization has been ancient Indian religion, where I did in my uh, did my MPhil and PhD, but then I digressed a little, went into uh, you know social history, looked at the issue of niyog uh, or surrogacy in early India, went on to do a, a, de uh, a detailed study on masculinities in early India, have also worked on ahimsa and. Uh, done a couple of projects and other things also so history is a passion with me and my latest passion as i told uh, my professor i have turned uh, from a school academically is gender studies so it is the intersectionality of religion with gender that fascinates me a lot and um, well i'm currently working on these issues beautiful uh, I welcome you again on behalf of Humanizing Lives and thank you so much for agreeing to do this session with us. I think it's a very, very important uh, discussion and I am uh, thankful to the academia uh, for giving us uh, scholars like you who, you know, who has that zest for, for life and research and questions that keep you going. So I'm starting and opening my discussion with the, my first question here. Uh, Ma'am, how old are the relationships and, uh, and in expectations that come with those relationships? Uh, we know of them today in a similar, in a, in, in a certain pattern, but uh, have they always been like that through history? Uh, you're talking about human relationships. You're talking about, I guess, relationships between men and women in particular, yes, well, as a student of history, and you are also one, uh, Namita. But before I start with that, let me thank you for inviting me on Humanizing Lives. I am quite fascinated with your motto and with the focus that you have on in this particular NGO, and that is on the emotional and mental well-being of people. And uh, when uh, Namita asked me to look at this issue of pressures on procreation from the perspective of the emotional well-being, I was uh, actually fascinated at one level, and it also made me think over time and again. Uh, well, uh, I have been groomed into looking at history from a certain perspective. All of us know there was a positive, positivistic kind of history earlier, political history. Then we were looking at socio-economic factors, and that's where my basic training is. But now, looking at the emotional, intimate history is something that has come to stay, I would say and has now allowed me to look at the entire gamut of literature that I have been reading in a different way. The perspective, the vantage has changed. And thanks to what you have asked me to do today as a matter of study, well, I have begun looking at the same genre of literature in a, in a very, very different way. So coming back to your question, uh, that when would such relationships come into being? Well, uh, uh, Namita, if you go back to the prehistoric societies and right from the time, say, of uh, the Paleolithic or the Mesolithic age, when we know that there might have been, uh, you know, band societies, nomadic band societies, the kind of relationships that may have existed, it may sound horrifying today, but they would have been incest. It's a very common thing because they're just 20, maximum 30 people together moving from place to place. But once settlement came in form of some kind of, you know, semi-sedentism or some kind of agriculture, well, that is when the social regulation would have started. So taboos on incest would have come up first and the institution of marriage would have come up. Now, marriage would have entailed something else. It is a social practice as well, giving away one very important resource of the family that is daughter from one, one tribe into another tribe and certain taboos and regulations coming up all along with. One important aspect which would have been there throughout, which I assume must have been there, is to ensure some kind of lineage perpetuation. You have to have a familial growth. There has to be some kind of growth and a growth done in a very prescribed format where at least men could be assured that the child born is there. So certain institu the institution of marriage would have come up then with its mm -hmm. entire, you know, uh, uh, litany of rituals and yeah. practices associated with it. And I'm not saying that the legality of would, it would have come up right in the beginning, but it would become at some point in time a religious practice. You know, if you were to tap the earliest of the sources that we have, and that is Rig Veda. Rig Wade says very clearly that men and women come together in order to procreate. So procreation or perpetuating your lineage or make, bringing about children 
is the foremost reason for which ultimately the the uh, you know the marriage has to be conducted so that became very very important manu when he's talking in manu smriti is talking about the same thing that a woman has been created to bear children and a man has been created to carry on the the lineage so two of them will come together in a heterogeneous uh, you know heterosexual relationship in order to uh, bring about children so the whole institution of marriage is with it a uh, you know certain set of norms uh, incest is controlled there would no be no incest in fact the rules would come up in such a way that you're not going to marry this side and that side for a couple of generations gradually that would come up and certain kind of exchange would come up as a result of it and finally the most important thing would be that it would ensure that there is social growth that is growth of the society in a prescribed format so to the best of my knowledge the earliest references to marriage as an institution in the indian context are already there in the earliest of the texts that we have rigved to which we can easily give a time frame from 1500 bce that is around 3500 years before right till up at you till the, uh, say the 1000 bce so you have the surya's hymn in which prajapati is evoked and prajapati says now that the surya would get married let the two of them i mean husband and wife bring children forth so procreation is there from the word go so to the viewers again uh, so the genesis of marriage is where uh, the relationship rules come into the picture a uh, very interesting list with a man puts out there that uh, incestuous relationships were also part of the practice before the society took a certain shape if i am wrong please correct me uh, map on that point no no certainly i mean that must have been the case uh, uh, well you know um, uh, namita if i were to go back to this very interesting hymn in rigved between yam and yami i don't know if many people are aware of that yam today is understood as the god of um, uh, of death he is the one yam raj who comes to take you at the time of death there is a very interesting hymn where yam and yami who are twins yami is the sister they are twins and yami is making a kind of an advance on the brother and says let's uh, be together let's uh, have a relationship together to which yama says no so this is probably a time of transition where incest is getting tabooed so we have oblique references of incest being there and even in greek literature when you talk about the electra complex electra and adipus and all this some form of incest must have been in society at some point in time which is gradually getting tabooed and it gets reflected in the myths and about myths namita what i would like to uh, suggest here is that we in the discipline of history do not dismiss myth as just a figment of imagination or something which is like a fiction because for us this must have been myths must have been the way of uh, a popular way of uh, of recording history there has to be a kernel of historical truth in it and without doubt it gets intertwined with so many other things in the sense that you have mysticism and you have you know fairy tales fantasies which are unbelievable but the discipline of history helps us sift through the material and cull the historical material out so if there is a myth of yam and yami in rigved which is the earliest rig sahita which is the earliest of the known literary text that we have in indian uh, context then there is also a kind of an oblique reference to the existence of this practice which was then getting gradually banned and that's understandable if you are moving in a banned society that may have happened it may sound very horrifying today but that's how the society must have evolved that's the burden of these so called expectations you know so the kind of sexual relationships that were to be maintained and the children that were to be born out of that relationship or that marriage or in or any such institution that existed back in the days and what happens when you can't have children you know so the social expectations that came out of a man and a woman coming together in a very institutionalized fashion uh and do we also find rebellion instances of rebellion uh, on on that uh, note so the expectations to start with and uh, the the problems if everything was not to go right 
and thirdly the kind of rebellions that we find uh, you know along the time yeah this was a this is i would say a very long <laughs> question yes. but yes i would try and uh, answer this uh, well as i just mentioned definitely the understanding is that if there was marriage then the result of the marriage had to be a progeny and more so it becomes evident a son gradually it becomes evident it has to be son but marriages can fail what i mean to say by marriages failing is that a child may not be born out of that marriage or a child may not be a son uh, so uh, which means that the husband could be impotent or the husband dies young now in this kind of circumstance we are talking about a society which is like thousands of years old and a society which may not have we where uh, at this point in time at the earliest point in time the emphasis may not be so much on uh, being worried about multiple sexual relations of a woman the emphasis may be on production of human resources in other words children so if the marriage for some reason whatever reason failed especially from the point of view of a man and uh, by and large all our texts are very androcentric and very very patriarchal social relationships that get reflected therein so if the marriage has failed for some reason to do uh, to achieve what it is set out to achieve uh, that is progeny then an alternative was also created which is referred to as niyog or surrogacy so this institution of niyog about which we get first we get references uh without it being uh, seemingly institutionalized but say after 4th 6th century bce it is institutionalized this is niyog is referred to as uh, the term that is used for it is apad dharma apad dharma is the law of exigency exigency something that happens in times of distress so it is not a practice to be followed in normal times it should be or it would be followed only in case the progeny is not coming out the son is not happening as a result of marriage so a very short term alliance would happen between the woman who is the kshetra called the kshetra and another man designated by the family the marital family where the consent of husband in laws all are taken into account the person is chosen the woman has a temporary sexual alliance with that individual with the sole clinical purpose of reproducing a son fine and after that they're supposed to move different ways so it is not a second marriage it is just a marriage which allows a woman to get reintegrated into the family with the birth of the son because if the son is there you see son is required because son is going to inherit property land is becoming important in agrarian society so son is going to inherit property son is going to do the pindadan the ancestral rituals and son is going to carry forward the lineage so son is very very important earlier societies are pastoral societies warrior societies and these such societies are really required to uh, you know hold you to protect your property the assumption is that a girl is not as strong as a as a man is and so sons there i would also pause in uh, for a moment and tell you that again going back to rigveda we have clear references of women participating in the wars there is a hymn by of vishpala who actually seemingly lost one leg in the in the battle and so she prays to the physician god's ashwins that please restore my leg so that i can go back to battle so we have references in the armies of the dasas women were there so it is not as if women were not there but by and by it may have been taken into account that women should be used for procreative purposes and so spare them that and the boys would be around the men would be around so even in pastoral societies and more so in the androcentric agrarian societies the emphasis on sons so this particular practice which is like a parallel practice of surrogacy short term thoda sa bas kuch dino ke liye saath aaye aur ladka paida ho aur phir alag ho jaye ab aap jo aapne baat kari hai mental health ki wo isme bahut zabardast aati hai how is it that anybody can do it in a very clinical way and you won't believe you say you said this is not possible but you know if you were to look at gautam dharma sutra which is post 6th century text this particular practice is like a ritual it's almost like a matter marriage ritual so the man is prepared in a certain way with hymns being sung out and mantras being chanted and you know certain ritual practices and then asked to get into the room of the woman 
so so it is a ritual which is very well looked upon you know everybody is also interested in seeing whether the consummation of this has happened or not and that once the son is born it is mentioned the two of them should not even look at each other which is which is very difficult to digest and as you say did the problems come up as a result of it uh, even when uh, there have not been clear references to it because we don't have we haven't got any journal or narrative on it but we can sense that kind of um, kind of unrest unsettlement unsettling feeling that happened especially when the surrogate happens to be a devar now uh, the term devar uh, many of us may not know actually means dwivar the stand in husband so the younger brother of the husband is to act like a stand in husband in case the husband for some or other reason is not able to you know do uh, do this particular act of procreation and this must be this must have made things very difficult for the inter uh, intra familial relationships because for a very long time you're looking at your devar as a brother you it's a jesting relationship it's where you really uh, within the family it is the the sister in law the bhabhi is open with devar and the two of them have like a brother sister relationship and yet she is groomed to believe as she grows up in case something happens to the husband your devar would come to your assistance in procreation this this would have definitely made things very difficult at that point in time also and we do get uh, references at least in one text that i must mention gatha saptashati uh, this is a text of first century ce and i find this text very fascinating it's not a sanskrit text it's a text uh, in maharashtri prakrit and it talks about relationship intra familial relationship and you can sense that bhabhi deva relationship is a very intriguing interesting one where the two of them are probably involved also at least in one of the couplets she says you remember you have to behave yourself in absence of your brother remember the relationship between sita ram and lakshman so this is what she tells this guy so there is a possibility is making an advance and saying that i am the stand in husband and the the woman is a kind of putting him putting him at bay so so that kind of a relation and there are also couplets where the two of them enjoy a lot the husband has gone up on a trip he is probably a trader and the two of them come together and enjoy and there is a reference to that also so the they would it would make relationships extremely complex from the point of view of mental health as you mentioned in your in your um, uh, you know ngo the what what you are trying to work about this would be taxing this would actually be taxing switching from one to another then going back to the old uh, because see if the husband is impotent he is not out of the scene at all he is very much there and it is with his consent and the child born out of this relationship is given the name of the legal father not the biological father so he is the product of that family that that marriage or still the marriage institution and he will inherit the property of the legal father so it remember the kind of complications that will come up uh, uh, there is another syndrome that he faces and that is a dwipita he is supposed to have two fathers now this is a practice which was never kept under shrouds so if the relationship has happened then everybody including the child knows about it the son knows about this so son would know that he will figure in you know he'll he'll go into this concept of dwipita he'll have this kind of a notion that he's he's got one legal father and one biological father and that kind of tension would definitely be there uh, though i would also acknowledge at least one case somebody who has not been affected by it was hanuman in the ramayan he always called himself he is somebody who is who recognizes his legal father and vayu his biological father also so one rare example but otherwise these are issues that would have bothered in dutya vakyam which is uh, mahabharata natya shastras uh, you know bhasas natya shastra uh, duryodhan refuses to give land or that particular piece of land to pandavas because they are born out of niyog and it is very strange he completely forgets that his father is also born out of niyog so he is also related he's there in the lineage but he's doubting this as uh, as an insult to to um, uh, the pandavas so if there is it is there as a part of myth we assume that these kind of tensions must be around even in everyday life it's not as if it would have got confined only to one particular family this must be there 
So it's the woman who gets very badly affected because she has got no say in choosing. She has, she has no say, it's decided. So whoever is the surrogate, she'll have to follow generally the deva. Sometimes it could be the Brahmins. Brahmins decided to be the best studs around. So they call themselves the best surrogates. Then in case there's nobody around, it's gods. Now God is such a good euphemism for whoever you are choosing to have relationship without naming the person. So it was an entire process of apad dharma. Apad dharma is actually, uh, of course, it's law of exigency, but it also tells us when you can flout the law. So it is law of, you know, exceptions also, when and where, and then yet get the veneer of legitimacy. So the child who is born, the only thing that is very sure, the son, so not the child, the son who is born out of it would be a legitimate son. That is assured in the sense that he has the right to property, is the right to do pindadan, which is a very, very important thing. And he's the one who's carrying the lineage. So he is assured this much, but he can always be made fun of. He could be called, you know, uh, you don't know who your father is, who's the real father and who is the legal father. Then the wife, uh, then the wife has got no direct control over the son. That is very interesting. The only thing that she is assured is that he'll take care of him in the in, in, in his uh, in the uh, old age. That is all. That's the only assurance that she has. Otherwise, the relationship is between father and son throughout its father and son. Whether it is the Oras, Oras is the uh, biological son, or it is the Kshetraj, or the Dattak, or the Panarbhav. There are 12 kinds of sons, by the way, which are mentioned. How obsessed our society was with sons. You can imagine each of the Smritis tells you in the Sutras that 12 kinds of sons Kshetraj is just next to Oras. So he's pretty high on the ladder. And he has, he has this kind of a support. But, uh, and what about the Bijan, the inseminator, the person who is called to have a relationship? Nowhere in the picture. <laughs> he's nowhere. He's put on the margins. He's done his job and he's out of it. And, uh, you know, at least in one context in, is in, in the ancient Judaism, where you have a parallel practice of um, levirate, we come across a particular myth where once the husband has died, uh, this is Tamar's husband died, so the brother is supposed to be the stand-in husband, and the two of them are forced into the room, and the brother runs away. He runs away, and he says, I will not have this kind of relationship because I'll never get the right on the child. The right of the child stays with my uh, you know, it is he's inheriting everything in name of my brother. And for that, the gods are displeased and he dies. So it has all these practices somewhere get entangled with religiosity. Some aspect of religion would come in and that would make things so difficult for people to comprehend and to react. So that's going to be going as one part of it. Now talking about the next issue that you say, do you have any examples of dissent against this practice? Yes, the dissent coming. Uh, interestingly, the questioning coming from both men and women. Remember that pressures of procreation are not just on women. They're also on men. If there are pressures on men too, how would they behave in these circumstances? In this circumstance. So on women, um, well, one of the best examples that comes, comes uh, uh, from a dialogic exchange between Pandu and uh, Kunti. Pandu, we know, is born out of uh, a neo practice. I think all of us are aware of the fact that Vichitravi, the father, had uh, died. He was addicted to hunting and gambling. He died. And Satyavati, the mother, tried to arrange a relationship with Bhishma, who had taken a vow of celibacy that he will not get into any relationship. But he said, okay, resort to Apad Dharma, and then you can have. Um, progeny through relationship with any Brahmin. That's when Satyavati says, I've had another son by another, you know, relationship who's Vedavyas. And so Vedavyas is called in um, to have relationship first with Ambika. Ambika was waiting for Bhishma. She got a shock and it was uh, Vedavyas. She shuts her eye and is cursed with the birth of uh, Dhritarashtra. Yeah. So when the second and, the, and Satyavati is not happy, so she sends the second daughter-in-law she is supposed to keep her eyes wide open, but she pales at the sight of a, you know, of an old, ugly, smelly man called Ved Vyas, and she turns pale. And so she is also um, uh, cursed to have a son, Pandu, uh, would be pale. And the third instance, when Ambika is forced again, she clearly shows her dissent here, 
by sending in the mate who has no problem and the relationship results in the birth of Bidur, who's the wisest of all the brothers, but then he is not the Savarna. So he'll never get that kind of status. So we have examples of dissent here, Ambika, Ambalika, but the best in, interesting dialogue comes between Pandu and, and uh, Kunti. Pandu realizes at some point in time that he can't bear kids. And um, he has retreated to the forest. He is doing tapasya. He's a very uh, good warrior and he's accumulated a lot of uh, wealth and kingdom also expanded kingdom. But then he retreats with his wives, both Kunti and Madhuri to the forest. And there uh, he, once he realizes that he can't have sons because he's cursed, he has killed a uh, doe and a uh, buck while they were mating. And so mythologically he was cursed. And so he asked Kunti to get in relationship with the Brahman and give him kids, sons. Kunti at this point in time balks at the idea. And that's a very beautiful dialogue between Kunti and, Panda, and Pandu. And she says, I love you so much. And I know you love me so much. And I know that you are a big tapasvi. You, both of us should pray together to the gods and they'll definitely bless us with a progeny. Uh, Pandu does not agree. He says, no, there was a time when there were ancient women like Madhyanti, uh, wife of uh, Kalmashpad and, uh, and Shardayani, who also had, on the, at behest of their husbands, produced children by getting into relationship with Brahmins. Now, this is something which Kunti is not able to digest, so she comes up with another argument. She says, no, there was another queen, Bhadra Kashivati. And once the husband died, she clung on to the corpse till the point when there was an Akashwani and she was assured that uh, uh, on a particular day, the husband will come, that his life will come back to the corpse and that uh, she can have progeny as a result of that relationship. So the two of them go on into argument after argument and she's telling him, please let us not get into it. I love you too much for it. I don't want to have a relationship with another man. He says, no, I don't have time. I need, a, I need to secure a position in heaven until I have son. And somebody to do Pindan, I'll never be able to reach there. So she, he forces her. That's when she says, okay, in that case, I have a mantra, which was given to me by Durvasa Muni. And I can call any god. And of course, he'll be a partner. I mean, Pandu has to be a partner into all these activities. And then we can have children from gods. So her three kids are, are you know, born out of dharma, out of, uh, you know, Indra and uh, Vayu. And then she's forced to give that mantra also to Madri and ask her to use it once she's smart enough to call the twin gods, Ashwins at the same time and have to. So all the sons are not Pandu's biological sons, but they're called Pandavs. While Karna will never be called Pandav because he's been born before marriage and without the consent of the marital family. So uh, there are examples, there are many other examples where the descent of the women becomes very evident. But it is not a very obvious <laughs> descent. She's trying to negotiate in her own way, but not always successful. She succumbs to what the patriarchal norm of the day is. आप सुन रहे हैं ना हम इतिहास की बातें सुन रहे हैं और इसमें कुछ भी ऐसा नहीं है जो हमें नया लग रहा हो कुछ भी ऐसा नहीं है जो हम आज महसूस नहीं करते हैं आ, आ, बहुत इतराते हैं हम आधुनिक कहते हैं खुद को और कहते हैं हमारे आ, एज में तो लड़कियां ये बन रही हैं लड़कियां वो बन रही हैं लड़कियां वो सभी कुछ तब भी बना करती थी लेकिन अगर हम एक जेनरलाइज्ड आम पिक्चर देखते हैं तो उसमें अभी भी ये लड़कियां मुट्ठी भर है तब भी ये लड़कियां एक आधी अपवाद थी एक तो बात ये रही दूसरी विवाह संबंध जो है उस वक्त भी समाज को डिक्टेट करते थे आज भी कर रहे हैं विवाह दो लोगों का मानसिक आर्थिक पारिवारिक तर्ज पर सामाजिक तर्ज पर एक, एक साथ आने की क्रिया हो सकती है लेकिन उसके साथ के जुड़े हुए शर्त जो है वो बहुत बार बहुत जिंदगियों में उथल पुथल मचा देते हैं कितना कह लेती है कुंती हाथ जोड़ लेती है कुंती मोहब्बत हो जाती है इंसानी रिश्ते भावनात्मक तौर पर ऐसे जुड़ते हैं कि किसी और के साथ जुड़ना मुमकिन नहीं होता है लेकिन इस सब के बावजूद पांडु को खुद नहीं पसंद है पांडु खुद ऐसे एक बच्चे हैं लेकिन उसके बावजूद जो नियम है जो आपकी अपेक्षाएं रिश्तों से वो उन दोनों को बांध रही हैं। अगर हम वास्तविक तौर पे आधुनिक होते तो शायद हम इनसे परे जा चुके होते व्यक्तिगत तौर पर अपनी जिंदगी को एक रूप रेखा दे रहे होते पर हम अभी भी नहीं कर पाते हैं 
trying to understand that a little better here, uh, uh, Smita ma'am. Uh, so what I want to understand here is what these only legal uh, conditions that were put out for the people uh, based on socio-economic convenience or uh, I mean how fair is it to weigh socio-economic importance of entities over their mental and emotional well-being. So do we also have instances in history when this uh, emotional aspect of this trouble is, is shown, like you showed in Kunti's and Pandu's case. It, it, are there more instances where the woman feels trouble, where the woman doesn't want to do it? Uh, instances in terms of myths? Yes, there are instances. There's a story of uh, uh, Bali and Sudeshna also, where Deer Tamas, uh, the, the uh, sage, is who is again very horrible to look at and smelly and all, is made to cohabit with Sudeshna and she runs away from the scene sending the uh, sending the uh, the maids and uh, and this carries on for some time uh, the king bali who had who's at whose behest she was uh, sent sudeshna was sent earlier is under impression that he is having progeny through uh, neo uh, but sudeshna is smart enough to send the maids and at a time when it comes when he tells the tamas you can leave the palace now you've done your bit, bit, bit. I will uh, thank you for what you have done. So he said, says that no, I'm, uh, I should not go because these are not your children. They're not your Kshetraj because they are born out of mate. And that's when Sudeshna is forced back. And she's made to do horrible things in a relationship with, with Dittamas. He has his revenge on her and says, you will have progeny, but they will be apanga, disabled. So cursing. And that is what happens. Uh, so there is a dissent, but generally the dissent is not uh, something that gives them a reward of their choice. Either you finally accept, like Kunti did, so things were easy for her. And if you don't, like Sudeshna did, then she was troubled, she was uh, cursed with a litany of disabled um, uh, progeny. Uh, so you have these kind of examples. But if you were to look into the, I mean, I can understand, you're probably trying to say if the legal system of the time ever took mental issues into account or emotional issues into account. Uh, Namita, no. <laughs> legal system was very, very much on the side of men and upper caste men. Actually, legal system, if you were to look at, is never going to take everyone, uh, never going to view everyone uh, uh, in the same way. In fact, Manu Smriti is considered to be the first text, a semi-legal text. And after that, Yagya Malki Smriti, Narad, Parashar and all, and right up to, Nara, uh, to Katyayana, have become proper legal texts. Manu Smriti um, is one text which uh, gives one stray reference, which I would say encapsulates a human mind and takes into account the will of the girl also. Uh, one stray reference, because otherwise it's very, very much against uh, women. It says that in case a girl is betrothed or engaged to a boy or a man who dies, so the ideal should have been that she should get married to the next surrogate, that is Deva, uh, provided she agrees to it. So I, I looked at this line sentence, I think four times. Did Manu really let that happen? Did he allow, did he, did he want a consent of the girl to be there? Because most of the time, the consent of the girl is, or of woman is conspicuous by its absence. They're told what to do. They are told that Prajapati has made, you know, things for you, like you should be involved in jewelry making, a jewelry selection. Otherwise, Prajapati would want you to do uh, cleaning of the house and many other things which are very, very putting them on the margins. But here the consent is there, one isolated example. Otherwise, the decision making is always on the side of men. Arthashastra gives one example where in case a woman has died and she's also pregnant at that time, you know, but there is a good man in waiting for her uh, to marry her. Then if with consent of her father-in-law, she can move out of the house and go to the husband, new husband. And this practice is called Nivesh, not new, but Nivesh. And here the father-in-law, if he's agreed to this, will act as the father and would give the dowry also and would let her go. So, so there's a change in a relationship. And there you, you understand if this practice, if this practice actually taken, uh, you know, a form of a clause in Arthashastra, it means somewhere uh, you can get this sense of affection between the daughter-in-law and the father-in-law. 
this might have happened. It's acknowledged as a practice. And she's called, she's, she is pregnant with a child. And the son is accepted by the second husband also. It's a, it's a very interesting, it's complex, interesting, but such practices may have been there. But what I'm telling you are more exceptions than the rule. Most of the time, women, they're, they're, they consent, uh, nothing is taken account, into account except one thing. A woman has the right to become mother. Motherhood is the defining moment of a woman in a woman's life. So in case the husband is not able to bear kids with her, she has the right to walk out of that marriage. She has the right to separate. The word divorce may not come, but the right to separate. She has the right to walk out and have a relationship with another man. And if she comes back to the family, they'll have to accept her. So much importance given to motherhood because a woman was created to bear children. It's very clear. There is no other. I mean, if a girl is born, then the understanding is that she would be groomed into believing that if not today, tomorrow, she has to become mother. And her role in the society is through motherhood. And that's a well-recognized role. Very well recognized, socially well recognized. You have a very interesting uh, myth again in the Mahabharata. There is a, a, a disciple by name of Uttank. His guru is out, uh, gone out on some kind of a work. The woman, when she's in a fertile period, and the assumption is after menstrual cycle, she's in a fertile period, she has the right to, to uh, having a sexual relationship. So if the husband is not there, she goes to Uttank that now it's a fertile period, I, this is my right. And Utang says no to it, I can't, I've treated you like a mother. And so it's a very funny scene because she along with the maids is after Utang and Utang is running away from the scene. And later on the guru is very happy that Utang has not transgressed it, but she is citing it as a right. Similarly, Sharmishtha in Yayati, Yayati's uh, wife is um, Devyani and Sharmishtha has become the slave to Devyani. So Sir Mista also says that now I can't get married to anybody. I have a right to have a relationship with you. And Yati says, I can't do that. I'm married to Devyani. And she'll be very angry if he says, but she says, this is my right given to me by Dharma Shastras. And you will have to concede to it. And he concedes to it. So the woman's right, if you're talking about, is primarily in her materializing her motherhood. That's the right that she's crafted. She's granted. I mean, the whole life I have thought that the right and the truth is a very positive term. Today, the first time I'm doubting myself today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, and in a sense, there is a push. Yes. It's not yes. Right, it yes. is what she has been internalizing yes. that if she has become, if she's been born a girl as a girl and a, and a woman, uh, it is her right and her duty, both. But if a duty is not full, then it's my right. If a man cannot have a child, he has Niyog coming to his rescue. What happens when a woman cannot have a child? I mean, and her legal status? Then the man remarries. It's clear. It's, it's a uh, polygamous society. If he is not able to get a child from a marriage, not just the child, if he's not able to get a son. So a woman may be reproducing, but only daughters. And very interesting. See, when the son is uh, born, he, he's immediately appropriated by the father. And when the daughter is born, and today we know it is the XY chromosome, and it's because of the man only, whether the child is going to be a girl or a boy, that is going to be decided. Uh, well, in that case, the woman is at uh, fault. So we have within the Smritis, we have been given certain time frames, you know, if she has been producing only daughters, so after eight years or 10 years, I've forgotten, uh, the man can re remarry. But if she has not produced any child after 10 or 12 years, so there is a waiting period, hoping that the, the, the marriage would materialize and marriages would happen at an early stage also. But in case there is no marriage, no child coming through the marriage and son coming through the marriage, the man has the right to remarry. But the remarriage does not mean that he abandons his first wife. That will never be the case. The first wife remains the part of the household. And sometimes she may be the, if it is in case of a, a royal or a rich household, she is the first one. So the ritual performances would always be done in any kind of a yagya, would be done by the first wife. So her position will get very threatened because there may be other wives, co-wives producing possible heirs to the property. 
but she would be there and the tension amongst the co-wives may also come up. There's no doubt about it. But the solution to that was he can have as many wives. It's only after uh, independence and change in our laws that we know that, uh, you know, polygamy has been banned within the Hindu uh, legal system. It has been banned. But till that time, uh, a man could have second, third, fourth wife without abandoning. The responsibility of the early wives continues to be this. So the solution was marry again. Or you could adopt also. There is a provision of adoption also. By the way, it's not just marriage. You could adopt too. In case you loved your wife too much and you don't want to marry anybody else, then generally the nephew is adopted. That tak, as he's called. He can be ado adopted. But uh, the chances of remarriage, you see what happens depending on your strata. If you are very rich and you can maintain a huge household, you probably go in for the second and the third marriages also. But if you are not, especially among the lower caste and the lower class, uh, there is a possibility that there's only one child, uh, there is only one marriage, and you either resort to Neog or you resort to adoption. Or, or you know, there are 12 sons. <laughs> one of them can always be there. Uh, but the chances of um, uh, polygamy are there in the higher caste, among the higher caste and higher class than among the lower. Because the wife has to be maintained. She cannot be abandoned. There's nothing like abandonment in, in Hindu tradition. They're supposed to be, husband and wife are supposed to be committed to each other, very clearly. All the Dharma Shastras say that. For Paksha, what happens with her life, her marriage and everything, is that a very uh, easy game to play? Uska earliest reference to Ara hai, wo 7th or 9th century. 9th century mein Medha Titi ki Manu Bhashya mein Ara hai where he acknowledges that a girl can be born. At least he acknowledges that it is born. Baki text to acknowledge me nahi kar rahe hai. Aur par ye saath mein bol diya hai, she should, she should, she's not fit to be married with. The term that is used is a methony. Iske saath vivaha nahi karna chahiye. And the matul or the mama is responsible for getting her. Niyog ko istamal karke court mein uh, present kiya gaya ho recent times mein jaha apne rights ko claim karne ki koshish ki gai waisa ko instance aapne apne research ke dolar paaya this is very interesting um, uh, namita kyunki niyog jaisi practice with independent india indian penal code mein acknowledge nahi kari gai hai but we have a strange kind of legal system where you also have customary laws you see one is under the legal system one is the customary local laws so I did come across a particular um, instance, a legal battle that was that has been recorded in um, uh, that is in the records of Allahabad High Court, 1979 verdict. Uh, this is relating to Dome community. Now this is very interesting. Neog as a practice has started among upper caste, but it goes trickles down till the till uh, amongst the lower caste people also. Or Doom community may a case aya hai, just in the land ke upar, there is a woman who had a child through Nyog and she demanded the son should be giving, getting a claim of land in the, uh, you know, the fam fam family land. So the other brothers took the matter to the court, Elabad court. And they said that this is not recognized anymore by Indian penal system and there's nothing like Shetraj anyway. So this can't be granted. Obviously, there are many competitors for, the, for, the, for uh, that piece of land. This woman fought this case in the name of customary laws. And Allahabad court finally acknowledged the practice of Neog and granted the son the right to the share of the property. It was granted as late as 1979. So I was so amused. The earliest reference I've got in Rig Ved Mandal 10. Okay, itna purana mujhe earliest reference mila hai, jo meri apni research mein. Aur abhi tak jo legal uske utar chadaav dekhte dekhte. 1979. So it's very interesting how the practices continue over time and space. It is not, and of course, they would change. I mean, it's not a very homogeneous practice. It would change, but the legal, interestingly, the legal system acknowledged it. So she fought, and this was a case that went on for three years. 76 may wada, 79 may wada, Allahabad High Court. So, modern times, how are these learnings? relevant in order to keep yourself sane here. Just Learnings 
in what sense has happened about miog i would say it's great i mean technology has worked us uh, worked out yeah the service issue has been resolved through technology that is that has been solved because we have so many scientific practices by which uh, you know the medical practices by which the issue the emotional issue the social issue associated with it does not come to light anyway now so that has been taken care of but at the same time i have always felt that um, uh, and when one is even teaching uh, gender as a paper this is what i would uh, tell my students as well that anything that comes in name of tradition jisko hum log aap aur main parampara ke naam pe jante hain aur bar bar dharm shastra mein ke ka naam le kar ke manu ne ye kaha tha aur ye kaha tha ye hamare ye hamari parampara ka hissa hai ye hamare dharm ka hissa hai i think one has to take it with a pinch of salt one has to contextualize at what point in time this practice came about and for whose benefit see there are some people and and let me tell you it is not as if it's only men benefiting out of it in general it is some men benefiting because it is it may become very harsh for other men also for anybody to openly acknowledge impotency is not an easy thing and the person right. has to acknowledge that the man has to acknowledge for it to be healed uh, through this practice of surrogacy to acknowledge that would be meaning a lot of emotional trauma so it is not as if all the laws that come all the norms that come away are given to you by god these are things which have been evolved by the society at some point in time trying to face a particular kind of a society and depending on who is in the position of power there is a politics of power there so if we take up you know things today also thinking taking up things like vrat rakh rahe hain जो भी कर रहे हैं अगर है आस्था के नाम पे कर रहे हैं वट वट आई वुड लाइक टू से इज लेट अस ट्राई एंड वर्क थिंग्स आउट आर सेल्स वी मे अराइव एट द सेम कंक्लूजन एज वर गिवेन बट इट शुड बी एन अराइवल यू शुड अराइव एट इट यू शुड नॉट टेक इट एज द गिवेन इट इज दैट इज वेयर आई थिंक योर ओन दैट इज वेन यू एक्सरसाइज योर ओनरशिप ऑन इट यू इट बिकम्स अ पार्ट ऑफ यू अदरवाइज इट इज एन इम्पोजिशन इट हैज बिन एन इम्पोजिशन फॉर इयर्स वी हैव बिन एक्सेप्टिंग इट कोई फर्क नहीं पड़ता करना ही है करते ही चले जा रहे हैं तो थोड़ा रुक करके सोच के एक्सेप्ट करके फिर करें इट्स नथिंग रॉन्ग इन फॉलोइंग इट बट यूल फील फार मोर एम्पावर्ड इफ यू आर पार्टिसिपेंट इन द प्रोसेस एंड यू आर नॉट जस्ट अ रिसीवर इन द प्रोसेस दैट इज वॉट आई वुड beautiful yeah that note uh, humanizing lives recognizes the pressures of procreation on women today and the for emotional stress it has been causing the couples not just the women but the couples in marriage through history and there are multiple examples across history for you and me to understand through smitha ma'am's guidance that there have been problems there have been problems of procreation always the only difference probably here is that in marriage today a woman sometimes chooses not to have a child and uh, you know maybe have a career or just be not have a career either just be uh, so irrespective of the fact is that history does not dwell too deep or even gives as much importance to the emotional aspect of these couples they have not been able to hide it to where they have not been able to conceal it to where kunti is still having a dialogue where she sounds distressed uh, uh, then we also have pandu who does register his uh, disagreement or hesitation rather on this account and all of this would have been unknown to us had it not been for smita ma'am so thank you thank you so much smita ma'am for agreeing to come here and uh, uh, presenting this talk to the audiences thank you so much for connecting with humanizing lives uh, ma'am you would like to add something uh, in the end maybe a very nice bye to humanizing lives on oh yes absolutely absolutely i would i would really like to thank you all I'd like to thank Humanizing Life for giving me a new perspective of looking at my entire work, and of of course giving me so many new ideas for future research. But I would like to be associated with it as and when you would invite me. And thank you so much because I think you are widening horizons. You are bringing into context 
uh, people who are working with you and looking at the problems of emotional his, uh, emotional and mental well-being i could see there are people from different ngos from you know the, those who are psychologists who are trying to take up issues that matter a lot especially in this pandemic i think you're doing a wonderful work thank you so much for